so I'm Simon Barrett, I'm a tissue viability lead from Humber NHS Foundation Trust, which is quite a long way away from here. Anybody from up north? Who said that? Originally. It's good, isn't it, up north? Yeah. So I'm from up north. I've been practicing the TVN now for, I think this is my 20th year out of 35 years of nursing. So it's been a fantastic experience so far. Hopefully we can share a few things together today. The triangle of wound assessment is what I'm here to talk about and it basically came about because of uh, the sequin targets of two years ago that lasted 2017, 18 and 19. So they've just finished. So if you've been involved with them, hopefully you'll have achieved your targets, hopefully you've been paid your sequin money and you're now investing it wisely in tissue viability. Or maybe not. <laughs> so we'll crack on. So the triangle of wound assessment, basically, would it be fair to say that nowadays we're working in very tight time frames? Yep. Are you all, just out of reference, are you all community nurses? No? If you're a community nurse, just put your hand up for us. Quite a lot then. If you're an acute nurse, put your hand up. If you're a practice nurse. If you are a student nurse, only one or two. If you're a podiatrist. If you're just here for a free meal. <laughs> oh dear, interesting. Well, wherever you're working nowadays, things have changed, haven't they, since... If anybody was practising in the 80s or before, I don't know whether there was any before that, uh, but people always used to say to me, even in the 1980s, do you know what, it was better in my day. Students who put your hands up near the back, has anybody said to you yet, hey, it was better in my day? Yeah? They do, don't they? Now, I'll say to you this, with regards to wound care, I'm not so sure it was better in my day. I'd say it was different, but I'm not so sure it was better. And the reason I say I'm not so sure it was better because we were having competitions in the 80s of how far we could pack wounds, and we would pack them with ribbon gauze soaked in eusol, hydrogen peroxide, acetic acid, and then we'd have the joy, wouldn't we, of unravelling it like magicians the following day or so. Now, if you remember back to those days, those things that we were packing tightly into wounds, because that's what we were told, were effectively causing significant amount of pain, and the patients were clinging to ceilings, you know, because they were like demented cats, they were in that much pain. Now, if that was better in my day, then I don't think it was, but it was all we had in our toolbox available. Now, so since the 80s, 90s, noughties, and now, we, things have moved on significantly, haven't they? We've got a massive range of dressings, some that do fantastic things, some that manage symptoms, some that cause a wound potentially to heal. What I would say to you is this though, is you are the key to the door. Not the dressing, you and your assessment. You build everything from your assessment. If you assess, um, make a diagnosis, document, communicate it, then there's a much better chance that the patient will have a better outcome. But I do worry that we don't always put all the parts of the jigsaw together. And a lot of it's to do with time, because that is one thing that does seem to have changed. Because going back to the 80s, I'll give you an example. You could come in for an aortic aneurysm repair, because I used to work on vascular for a lot of my acute work, uh, career. Um, you could come in for an aortic aneurysm repair. Post-op recovery would usually be about three weeks. Now you look if it's three or four days. So by week three in my day, the patient was pushing the tea trolley and giving out the cups of tea. Now they're at home trying to recover, usually under the care of some community service. So the pressures have been put on us all, haven't they? And if you're going in to do a wound, I almost think nowadays, John, the holistic patient, has become John the wound. Or, or Judy the wound in your case, because I'm looking at you, aren't I? And you don't look at Judy's eyes in case Judy might ask me a question. So I just focus on Judy's leg, wherever her leg ulcer or whatever it is, because I'm fearful that if I've only got a 10 minute slot, she might ask me a question that's going to take me 11 or 12 minutes. And that's no good because I've got to be in my car and off to the next visit because I've got 20 odd visits today as opposed to in the 80s, maybe 10. So things have changed and it's all down to us to try and, if you like, find a way to work more efficiently. So the only efficiency that we can bring about, because we're never going to get more staff realistically in relation to our patient populations, so the only way we can improve is to do a good holistic assessment. 
So when we've done our holistic assessment and we then start to focus down on the wound, we must consider the wound bed, the wound edge and the peri-wound skin. And if we put those parts of the jigsaw together, then we might stand a chance. Now there are things that we've been doing for years and hopefully we still continue to do. And those things are making sure that we work as part of a multidisciplinary team. So if a patient has, has got some nutritional deficits and it's outside of our remit and all we've been able to provide is some supplements maybe, then let's involve the dietitian. There's an awful lot with those people with venous hypertension that are leaking gallons of fluid coming out in exudate. There's a lot of protein being lost. How are you routinely replacing that loss of protein? The proteins are the messengers, so the messengers are not getting out from the wound and bringing everything to the party. So unless we automatically replace it, we're going to have a problem, aren't we? So we need to think about it holistically. Reduced blood supply, well there's two ways of looking at that. There's the compression blood supply that's reduced because of pressure damage, or there's reduced blood supply because of peripheral arterial disease. Now pressure ulcers, in theory, it should be that simple that you remove the pressure, you reperfuse, Bob's your uncle, you don't have any skin damage. That's not the case with peripheral arterial disease, is it? Because we need to make sure we get them replumbed. So we'll need to refer through to vascular. And we have certain criteria and pathways locally, don't we, that we do that for. But again, with a, with a, a pressure damaged uh, skin integrity, we just need to try and remove that pressure. Now, do you remember in the 80s, early 80s, we were still using oxygen egg white. Does anybody remember it? Yeah. Did it work out of interest? Because I was only a lad. We thought it did. Bob on, dead right. You're exactly right. People tell me, oh, it was due to the protein in the egg white and this, that and the other. And blowing oxygen into the wound helped it heal. Well, it didn't. It was exactly as this lady said. It took you longer to do the repositioning. So therefore, it was reperfusing the skin integrity all that time. So again, it just shows the key to the door was you doing a good job of repositioning, taking your time, checking the skin integrity and making sure it was all right. Do you remember we used to go around with back trolleys, tin trolleys, stacked up with everything, talcum powder, a green piping for <laughs> blowing our oxygen out, didn't we? So things that, as I say, have changed. Some maybe for the better, some maybe for not, but we can learn and we can take action appropriately. Medication, do you know what the patient is taking? Is it a shoebox full of medication that may be inappropriate some of it, or it may be actually potentially quite dangerous to their healing? The one that I would mention is Nicarandil and the way that it can potentially induce anal ulcers that do mimic or almost look like pressure damage around the anus, but they're not. So we need to be aware of the medications, how it interacts and what it can, can potentially do to the healing process. The same with your cytotoxics with your chemotherapy and your radiotherapy. Now, unfortunately, we're all getting a bit bigger, aren't we? Our hips, I hate to tell you whether you're a man or a woman, will expand by one and a half inches as we age, which makes your abdominal muscles not be become quite as tight as the ones were. Um, so your solution is you either try and maintain optimum weight where your abdomen doesn't start to spread uh, as man is doing, or you get some... Um, Mr. Incredible Pants. Have you seen him? The superhero ones where he pulls his belt on and it all shifts up to his chest. So the reason being is uh, blood supply through fatty tissue is very much reduced. So you want your optimum weight if you possibly can and there'll be an image later on that shows that. Poor circulation I've mentioned, we need to get them replumbed potentially. Uh, that could be in the form of angioplasty and stenting or it could be revascularization through a graft. Psychological status, does the patient actually want to heal? Which is a big issue, isn't it? You've got, you've got people now who may only have the contact with the outside world with the district nurse. So the district nurse brings in all the information, but the district nurse is too busy now because they're talking to Judy the wound, not Judy the person. So unfortunately, we as community services, acute nurses, practice nurses, wherever we're working, we don't seem to have the time that we used to have. Infection has become a big risk factor, hasn't it? And anybody going into hospital thinks, am I going to get an infection? So much so that in a, a few years back, do you remember uh, a certain uh, high street retailer started producing silver pyjamas? Does anybody remember that? Did anybody buy any? <laughs> I wonder why. So 
you know, we, we've got to take the right precautions, but again, a lot of it is down to us in our aseptic techniques. It's not the dressings, it's our pro processes and practice that we use to prevent and reduce the risk. Uh, reduce wound temperature. Well, again, in the 80s, when I'm saying it once a good maybe, we used to strip wounds. Do you remember for the consultants coming round who were gods? I want that wound stripping sound and I'm coming at two o'clock on the dot. I want all the patients on the bed. They're not allowed to use the commode. They must lay there to attention. And he used to strip them down, didn't you? And you'd put a paper towel, sterile paper towel over the wounds, which would protect the wound amazingly against all outside extremities. It was amazing. If that's the case, why on earth don't we just use paper towels instead of all these dressings that we use? I, I don't know. And then the consultant would come, wouldn't he? And he'd come on and be in a bit of a mood because he's been in theatre and he's been a bit stressed. We had two. And they used to come on and they were like, I have all the engine as they came down the water. It was like steam coming out their ears. And the faces used to go bright red if there was anybody talking or not acting as they should be. And um, anyway, the, the beep, 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 beep would go off and you think, oh, he's gone. He's gone again. I'll have to come back. Don't worry, I'll be back. As soon as I've finished the, this fempop graft, it's an emergency. And they'd come back a couple of hours later. By that time, we'd put on three, four, five paper towels. So we'd laid it up, haven't we? And then we had the job of trying to get it off. So it was amazing. Now, if you think about it, roughly speaking, for every half an hour that we have that wound stripped down, it takes four hours to get back to body temperature. So it's delaying it. So we try to reduce the risk of disturbing the wound bed by taking the dressings off as infrequently as possible. So as long as it's appropriate for the wound, then you shouldn't be disturbing the wound too much in the community. We need to get away from that ritualistic practice of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because it fits in, or Tuesday and Thursday because the lady wants to have her hair done, or the man wants to go for a pant or whatever. So we've got to make sure that we're coordinating the care that's appropriate to meet that wound and that patient's need. It's critically important that you address the underlying disease process that's there in the first place. People don't end up with chronic wounds for fun. If a patient's fit, well and healthy, they will heal with the simplest of dressings on. But if they're not fit to heal, then we've got to try and work as that multidisciplinary team to get them as fit as possible and then use the appropriate dressings to manage the symptoms that are in front of us. Maceration, big problem, isn't it? Skin is what? What is skin? Somebody shout at me. It's a, an organ, it's an organ and a barrier. And it is, so one of its specific tasks is to be a barrier. It protects us, it's very good at protecting us. Holds everything in place and does multiple things. Largest organ in the body, do we value it as well as we should? No. If I was to, please don't let this happen God, if I was to collapse and die in front of you now of a heart attack, hopefully you'd all run forward because you can care in nurses, and you'd resuscitate me. If you do do that, could you please make sure I want the full uh, mouth to mouth and everything doing. I don't want just a quick thump and off I go. Now, if I was to fall, trip over a cable you'd, and lacerate my hand, you'd probably just go, oh, you silly old devil. And maybe root around in your bags that you picked up some dressings and think, I'll take my time, I'll maybe give him this dressing. If I like him, if I don't, I won't. But we don't value it in the same way, do we? I don't know whether you can see, certainly I won't track the camera to my head, but on my head, I have a, um, what my wife calls a decapitation line on my head. I don't, can you see it? It's quite pronounced, isn't it? I've tried growing a fringe to cover it. That's what you're meant to do, but it, it's not worked. I've tried pulling, it, to pulling my hair forward. It's not having it. So I have a colleague who does uh, aesthetics and she, I said to her, would it, would it be possible for Botox on this? So she said, oh no, it's gone far beyond that, Simon. Needs fillers. So I said, oh no, knickers to that for a lark. I'll just stick with how it is. It's part of me. But as a TVN, have I valued my skin as much as I should have done? You know, do I look my age? Do I not look my age? I would say it was, I have a reason. I was very poor, well, I'm still quite poor sighted, but I was as a child, but I was too vain to wear glasses because they used to make me wear a patch on my eye, which used to get me into fights. So I would not wear my glasses. So I was always sat at the front of the class squinting, and that was the cause of my wrinkle, I say. That's what I'm saying anyway. So yes, we must value our skin. We must use appropriate emollients, and we must encourage the patients as well. Um, what I would say to you is this. It's vitally important that you look after that wound margin. 
my little lad's a bit of a swimmer and I always say to him when you're going onto your marks and you're going to go in a race make sure there's no water on the edge because if you've got water on the edge where you're going to take off from and you slip you're going to belly flop straight into that water and he said okay dad he's only 11 okay dad I'll make sure and he does he always checks his position before he goes it's like his little routine now and then he dives in and he's off down the pool and he's usually quite good so if that's the case, imagine that as a wound. If you've got a wet wound margin that's macerated and slippy, then you are never going to get epithelial contraction. So as the epithelial tissue jumps in to try and swim across the granulation, it's just going to belly flop straight in and you'll get a regressing wound margin. So it's vitally important that part of that jigsaw, you look after the margin. Per wound management, well that's us. If we make the wrong assessment, the wrong diagnosis, the wrong treatment plan, then you'll keep getting variations in your care because you'll go in one day, your colleague will go in another and they say, oh, I don't like that dressing, I'm going to try this one, this is much better because you favour that dressing for whatever reason. But that's not right, we should try and stick to a plan, a management plan, at least give the wound a two week challenge, whatever we're doing, review it every time we change the dressing and do a big review after the two weeks and think, right, this is what I need to do next for that wound. We must relieve pressure if we possibly can and encourage the patient, the carers, the next of kin, whoever's looking after the patient to help reposition if the patient's unable to do it for themselves. As we get older, sadly, we all become less mobile, don't we? I can no longer run the 100 metres as quick as I once could and I was challenged by a 16-year-old at our rugby club the other week who was the off-half and I played off-half and he beat me convincingly. So I was devastated. So unfortunately, it happens to us all. Substance abuse is a big problem in inner cities. Um, I don't know how bad it is in Bristol. I don't know whether it's the same as it is in Hull, but there's terrible things going on in Hull's inner city centres that's making businesses close and move out because there's such an issue with regards to drugs. Now, there's a, uh, when I worked on vascular, there was an increasing, creeping uh, prevalence of people coming into the acute sector who had injected into various places that caused uh, peripheral circulation problems which resulted in ulceration and some people losing limbs because of it and even some losing lives. Um, so it, it is a creeping problem that we need to try and prevent and reduce that risk if we possibly can. So what does the wound need? It needs a good holistic assessment, it needs a good skin assessment, it needs a good management plan, it needs to be documented well, whether you use electronic records, which hopefully we're all going towards, or whether you use a paper record. Just out of interest, who's on electronic records? Just put your hands up. About half. So does that mean half are on paper? Yeah? You're half and half. You're in the transition period at the moment then. That must be even more difficult. Yeah. So you're duplicating a lot of stuff, I would have thought. Yeah. And those that are on electronic records, just out of interest, do you find it easy or has it been a struggle? Easy. See, I found it a bit of a struggle, but I've put it down to my age and incompetence with uh, IT. But once you get the knack of it, there's so much you can do with it and there's so much information you can pull from it without having to do individual audits. It's all there for you. And it will, in a court of law, back you up. As long as you've documented what you've done, it'll back you up and it's there. Make sure the wound has the right environment. So the right environment is warm and moist, as simple as that. The dressing that you choose should be aiming to create a warm, moist environment. And if we do all those things and put that together as the jigsaw, then I reckon there's a fairly good chance you will get better outcomes for yourselves, your organisation, but ultimately your patient. So the triangle of wound assessment basically was developed uh, by a group of tissue viability nurses and supported by a coloplast. Um, and they've rolled it out and we've tried to incorporate it into our system as well to make sure that we achieved our targets for our sequins. So the good news for us in Humber, because we improved the way that we assess, we proved that we could increase our uh, ratio of patients that were being appropriately assessed and we got paid our money. I'm going to say this on camera, which may, you may need to clip, cut this one. Our start line or our baseline for our holistic assessment as a percentage what do you think it was before we started it did we when I say assessments a complete holistic assessment how many out of a hundred patients do you think we were completing 24 
No, it wasn't that bad. I will say that on camera. <laughs> it was, it was for, 40, I think it was 44%, 43 point something percent. That's what we were achieving. And the, the commissioners wanted us to obviously to be up in the high 90s. Now, there's two ways of looking at it. If you're only that low, then there's a fairly good chance with the right uh, changes, you can get that up. If we'd have been at 90% and they said we want a 5% increase, it'd have been nine impossible. So we managed to increase it up to 60 odd percent very quickly in six, in six months by introducing the tool, giving good education and making sure the staff were on board with it. And then by the end of the two years, we were up to the, in fact, we got up to 93%. So the commissioners were very happy. We, we managed to hit all of our targets and goals. But it's really important that you do use the wound assessment too, whether it's this one or whether you use one that's local to you, to make sure you set the right management goals and you have the right treatment in place, addressing the wound bed, the wound edge and that surrounding skin. So we should be looking at things like the tissue type, we should be looking at exudate, we should be looking at infection, all those things that you would normally think you would do. Sometimes I think we think we've done it when in actual fact you look back at the documentation and it's not quite as good as we could have done or it could have been. Peri wound skin, we need to look at maceration, excoriation, any dry skin, any hyperkeratosis. If there's any callus, do we need to refer them to podiatry to remove it to offload? If there's any eczema, do we need to refer through to dermatology if it's outside of our scope or to tissue viability? Uh, hopefully you've all got pathways in place and, and ways of getting into your tissue viability service as well. Wound edge, again, similar sort of things. Are we looking at maceration, dehydration, any undermining, any thick and rolled edges? Undermining, do you all know what that is? No. no, thank you, whoever said no. It was a very assertive no, I like that. Undermining, the way I would say to you is this, if you was a miner, you bore a hole down to the level that the coal is at, and then you start to man horizontally. So the hole that you see is only small, but the undermining is the depth at the level of the damages how far does it go horizontally? So it's the same with a wound. You may only see, for instance, a five by five opening at the top, but it may undermine at the depth of the damage, 10 by 10. So you've got to be able to probe and see how far that goes. If you do probe though, please try and avoid using those metal ones with the hooks on, because I always worry that it's like hook a duck, what you're gonna, what are you gonna pull out when you extract, extract your probe. So the wound bed, Looking at the wound bed, we need to look at the tissue type. Is there any necrosis, any slough, any granulation, any epithelial tissue? We need to look at the exudate level. Is it dry, low, medium or high? This is a little bit woolly for me, if you like, and it's slightly better than plus, 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 which we used to use, didn't we? And at, at, in a court of law in front of um, one of our learned friends, I was questioned, Mr. Barrett, please explain what these three kisses mean. Well, they don't mean anything to anybody else but the person that's documented it. So be very careful when you're talking about exudate. Try and consider the viscosity of the fluid that's coming out as well and what it actually looks like. So is it thick custard or is it like a glass of dry white wine? Try and think of it in terms of the World Union of Wound Healing Society 2007. Is it dry? Is it moist? Is it wet? Is it saturated or is it leaking? Use words to describe. Infection, you should be able to identify whether there's any signs of uh, risks of infection. What are those signs? Are there two or more? Is there a local or is there a spreading infection? If there is, what are you gonna do about it? Do you need to swab it? Only if you're gonna give antibiotics. You're only gonna give antibiotics if you've got two or more signs. So realistically, we should be reducing our antibiotic use. We should be use reducing our topical use of antimicrobials as well, but again, if we do need to use them, let's use them appropriately. We talk about two week challenges, but it's two weeks, then review, maybe continue, maybe discontinue and change to something else. Antibiotics, we always say rule of thumb as well. If you're gonna give antibiotics for a chronic wound, you need two weeks, because all it'll do if you give for a week is dampen it down and then you get a flashback and it starts again and they say, oh, it's come back. Well, it hasn't, because it never went. So two weeks is what you're needing. The wound edge, like I say, this is my ladder, is diving position, so we need to make sure 
Are there any signs of maceration, that white boggy maceration? Is there any dehydration, so do we need to rehydrate the skin? Is there any undermining, so do we need to probe and see how far it goes? And is there a raised rolled edge, which may indicate, unfortunately, either infection or malignancies, so we may need to refer on for a biopsy ASAP. The peri wound skin then, similar sort of questions we need to ask. Is, it, is there any maceration, any excoriation, any dry skin, any hyperkeratosis? Do I need to hydrate it and then remove it because it's trapping bacteria underneath? The callus, if that was left like it is with no offloading and not removed, all you'll do is cause further pressure, more damage underneath, and then you've got a high risk of infection. Is there any eczema there? Do we need to treat it topically that we can manage or do we need to refer on to dermatology for stronger uh, steroids? Step two, setting our management goals then. So again, once you've identified what the problem is, the management goals should flow very easily, shouldn't it? So it becomes almost um, re like reading a book, effectively. You start at the beginning, you go to the middle and you come to an end. Now this suits me really well because I, I come from a vascular background, if you like, surgical intervention, and I liked a start, a middle and an end. I really struggle with medicine because it was always a start I'm in the middle, I'm still in the middle, I'm still waiting in the middle, and a lot of the time it was because you couldn't get a consultant review in time as well. And I say that purely because for two and a half, three years, I worked in hospital management and trying to get, when you was having significant bed pressures, trying to get a, a medical physician to come and review the patients was nigh and impossible. But the surgeons are there every day, reviewing the patients, seeing them and discharging as and when hopefully fit and appropriate. Step three, choosing your treatment plan then. Well, again, once you've identified what your problem was, you set your management plan and you start to treat it. So you have uh, this patient, for instance, is Neil. He's 40 years of age and he's had abdominal surgery. He was trying to lose weight, basically. So he's had some surgery and you can see there's a surgical suture line down his midline. Unfortunately, with poor Neil, he... Um, developed a hernia, it dehissed, the wound dehissed when he had it uh, reduced and he was left with this open wound. So based on what I've already said to you, what's stopping Neil from healing? Slough, so slough's one problem potentially, so that tells us we need to do some good wound bed preparation, which may need clean, we need to clean that wound and potentially prepare it to heal. Anything else? The oxygenised tissue, and you're saying that because of the discoloration of the granulation? His obesity. His obesity, yeah. He has. The gentleman, unfortunately, although he's obese, he's got a lot of fatty tissue and his dietary intake is not good. So he needs referring to the multidisciplinary team. He needs to have a dietitian involved and we need to obviously get him to take the right diet which will allow him uh, a good protein intake to account for that loss as well. Anything else? Is is what, sorry? Fluid loss, so he's losing protein, so we need to replace it. There's one other thing that I'll tell you, a very quick story. Yeah, scar tissue. There's a bit of bacterial burden which is allowing for that discoloration. There's a lot of extra date, like you said, but there's one thing, if anybody can remember what we used to do in the 80s. In Hull, we employed the scrotal ferrets scrotal ferrets. Nobody remember the scrotal ferrets or they've never come across them in Bristol. Good at cleaning things. Yeah, they were very good. We used to employ them. Every shift when we came on duty, the student nurses were called scrotal ferrets, the male student nurses. The scrotal ferret for today, Simon, is you. You've got to go around all the surgical wards with your blue blade, your talcum powder, and you've got to shave your patients. Now, obviously we don't do that now, and in Neil's case it hasn't been done, so he's got hairs growing into his wound, which is acting as a foreign body, so the body starts to try and evacuate it by increasing the exudate level as well. So we need to prepare the surrounding skin a little bit as well, don't we, and look after it. Don't employ the scrotal ferrets though, because it was a, a mundane job. So step one. We look at the wound bed, the tissue tape, and we identify that there's some slough there. We look at the exudate level, it's fairly high level of fluid coming from there, and the viscosity is thick as well. We've also got increased exudate, uh, showing a sign of infection. We've got delayed healing, 
and we've got that dusky purpley colour as well that shows there's a bacterial bed in there for us with Neil. So once we've identified what our problem is in our assessment, we can then go forward to start to make a plan for him. We look at the wound edge, there's a little bit of maceration there because of the high level of uh, exudate. There's also a little bit of rolled edges, but the rolled edges is because of his his weight more than anything else. There is some undermining, so we need to decide, do we put some fillers in there to get a contact, or do we uh, leave it just with a simple dressing on top? It potentially would have needed some negative pressure applied into there at the, at the early stage, allowed it to heal up, then we go step it down onto more traditional dressings. Just out of reference, does anybody use the term pack anymore? To pack a wound? Right, because what we're trying to get away from is packing. We're trying to say that, yes, we should lay dressings in, but we shouldn't be packing, because if you pack, and I mean pack in the ways that we used to do, tightly down to the bottom of the wound, effectively all that does, certainly in the sinus and such like, it will trap the fluid, the bacteria, in the fluid at the bottom of the wound. So it will not allow it to come out effectively, so you'll always have a bacterial loading at the bottom of the wound, which will then translate into an infection. So it's really important that you let the exudate drain out through the dressing that you're laying in. So it's just about getting a contact with that wound margin, that's all you're trying to achieve. Assessment of the peri-wound skin. Well, there wasn't too much of an issue there, just that little bit of maceration near his umbilicus. Other than that, he was okay. So we don't need to do an awful lot apart from prepare it and get rid of those hairs. Devising our management plan then. So remove the non-viable tissue, manage the exudate, manage the bacterial bed and protect his skin. And if we do that and we involve the multidisciplinary team to complete the triangle of wound assessment, then we've got a fairly good chance of getting the better outcome for Neil and his wound. Step three then is choice. Well, the choice at this, we need to have a primary dressing, so you'll put a filler in, and then you need to have a secondary dressing. So you want something that's comfortable, conformable. In this particular case, you could use, as it's suggesting here, uh, a biotane silicone. The biotane silicone will also conform to the wound bed to a depth of two, two centimetres. What it won't do though, is it won't conform to that undermining areas, which is where you will need your filler. So case study two is a pressure ulcer. Uh, this is a 28 year old gentleman with a, a small ulcer of three centimetres by three centimetres by one centimetre on the leg. There's some slough present, there's a high level of exudate and it's got a, tr a dry peri wound area to his skin. No signs of infection present, but I would say there's a bacterial bed in there. Uh, so the devising of a management plan is again, we look at what we need to do. So we remove the non-viable tissue, we manage the exudate level and then we go on to our goals for both the peri-wound skin and the wound edge. And again, it's about managing the exudate, removing the non-viable tissue, allowing it to have that good margin to allow the epithelial contraction. If you haven't got that good margin, then you're not going to get a wound to heal. So with the treatment plan, what they did, they put on some biotin silicone, it conformed into the wound bed because of its 3D technology. Uh, went to the bottom of the wound effectively, had that intimate contact and allowed to create a warm, moist environment that allowed the wound to go on towards healing. Yes, it took a little bit of a time because of obviously the patient had a compromised circulation, but in, in, in what it did was create a nice warm environment and bacteria free. So the ideal dressing should, in theory, Maintain a moist environment, manage exudate, be atraumatic, it, should it shouldn't shed any fibres, it should be a good bacterial barrier, it should have good skin adhesion, it should, in theory, aid debridement, and I say aid debridement only if appropriate. It should conform to the wound bed, it should keep the wound bed close to body temperature, and it should be cost effective as well to you. And you're, to be honest, you are the person or the people that make it cost effective. It's only cost effective if you follow the instructions in the information leaflet. If you're going in every day because the patient demands you do, or you're changing it every day because the consultant says it needs to be, that might not be appropriate management of the wound. And we need to get away from that ritualistic practice. Now, this is just a, a sad set, a cross section of 3D technology of biotin silicone, just giving you an indication of how it conforms into the wound bed. 
So it takes away potentially the need to use a filler. As long as it's only two centimetres or less deep, it could be a cost effective way of managing a wound by reducing the need for sandwiches, shall we say. This will conform into that wound bed. And that's just another example of how it goes on, it swells and fits into that wound bed. So you get that intimate contact. If you do want any information on this presentation, certainly with regards to the triangle of wound assessment, or if you want to find out any more about 3D technology, just go across to the stand, the Coloplast stand. David's gonna present next and then there'll be a natural break. So you'll have plenty of opportunity. Go across, there's bags already done for you with all the information in it. Ideally, what you need to do is avoid this chappy. And no, it's not my dad, if anybody's thinking it, and Chris will be sick of me saying this. Um, it isn't my dad, but what I will say to you, you do not want to be in front of one of these chappies because you know the old saying, if it's, if it's not documented, it's not done. And it, it is quite honestly the case. We have got to improve our documentation. The triangle of wound assessment has certainly helped Humber improve its documentation. It's given us like a safety net, if you like, to say, we've done this, this and this at this particular time. It drove us towards developing this management plan for this patient, and this is what we did as part of our management plan, and these are our outcomes. And we've been able to show over that period of time that we've healed an awful lot of wounds that have been static because the way that was revisited and reassessed. I'll give you an example. In one of our areas, we had a regular, at any one given day, we had between 95 and 100 wounds on our caseload. After going through and reassessing, reevaluating, documenting, improving the way that we practice using the triangle of wound assessment, those patients have reduced now to 50, I think it was between 55 and 60 on any one given day. So we've nearly reduced it by 50% because of the way that we look at those patients now. So I know it can be quite time onerous, but like I said at the beginning, the only way you will make time is by investing in time at the beginning. So take longer to do your assessment, document it well, communicate it well to your colleagues, and you will reduce your risk, your organization's risk, and you will get better patient outcomes. So your conclusion is about, yes, you need to choose the right dressing at the right time for the right length of time. There's no doubt about that. But the key to the door, like I said at the beginning, is you. Make sure your communication is good with your multidisciplinary team. Make sure you are working as part of a team and not against each other. And hopefully you will all improve your outcomes. Now, I know you're probably thinking to yourselves, but we do all that. That's fine if you are. That's absolutely brilliant if you are. But I can tell you, in our organisation, based on those, that data that we had, our start point, our baseline to our end point, we weren't completing a full holistic assessment. There was bits that was being missed off our assessment, which is why we only got 40 odd percent before we, we introduced the triangle of wound assessment. So hopefully it's something you can think about. Like I say, at your natural break, after David's session next, go along to the Coloplast stand. There's everything there, the presentation. You can read through it a little bit slower and you can look at the products as well if you want. All right. Anybody got any questions? That's good. <laughs> That's good. Thank you very much. <laughs>